All right, welcome to our Catholic Faith Study Series. Today's topic is going to be on salvation, how God's grace works through faith and love in our lives, and the Catholic teaching of salvation. There's so many different variations of how we're saved uh, out there that what I would like to do is be able to explain to you today what is the church's view on salvation and how we are saved. But before we start, uh, I wanted to let you know this presentation and the longer document, the PDF documents, are in the comment section of the Facebook video. So you can get the links. The links are there. Uh, they'll go to a Google Drive, and then you can pull those up. And in fact, all the other presentations are, are there. Both the PDF document and this PowerPoint presentation are all in those links. So let's start out with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So to start out with, what I'd like to do is teach you a, a fancy word here. It's really, it's really a, a word that's very common to us, but at the same time, in theology, it has a little bit of a different meaning. We're going to talk in understanding the economy of salvation. What is the economy of salvation? The, the word economy comes from a Greek word, oikonomia, which is from two words, oikos, which means house, and nomos, which means the law. So basically, it's the management of one's household, or the laws of the, of the household. And what household we're talking about here is the household of God, the people of God. So when we talk about understanding the economy of salvation, what we're talking about is, how is salvation brought about in God's household, in his family. And this is going to be a very important point that we'll make throughout this presentation, is that salvation is the number one thing, the most important thing that we should be asking about. How am I saved? What must I do to have eternal life? This has been asked to Jesus in the scriptures, and we'll go through it here in just a minute, but there's no other question more important than that, because if we get this one wrong, Everything else that we do doesn't matter. We've got to get this one right. Jesus died on the cross for us to redeem us, and he bridged that gap between us and God. There was a separation from the beginning after Adam's sin between all humankind and all uh, in God's presence. And with that, um, we couldn't share in his communion, in his glory, because we were separated from him. That grace that, re that was required for us to be in full communion with him was no longer there like Adam and Eve had it in the beginning. And so Jesus came to redeem us, to bridge that gap between us and God so that we could finally share in God's eternal life, in his very spirit, in his life. And God wanted that for us from the very beginning. But he had to prepare his people throughout this salvation history through this economy of salvation and we won't cover the history of the salvation but we were we are going to try to find where this answer is, is going to start the answer to this important question then we have to first understand who we are who are we as individuals as humans and what we were created for when we can understand this then we can start to understand how God approaches the economy of salvation for us, how we're going to be saved. And the answer to this starts at the beginning, at the very beginning in the book of Genesis. Genesis is one of my favorite books because it gives answers to so much of what questions that human beings have in their heart. Why did God make us? How did he make us? Who am I? And what does God want for me? Does he have a plan for me? Do I have a purpose in this life? And so we won't cover all those subjects, uh, all those topics tonight on who we are, but I will give you 
the, the short answer of who we are. When God created us, he gave us a special gift, a gift that he did not give the rest of the animal kingdom. He gave us his spirit. And how did he do this? We see this in the book of Genesis chapter 2, in the, book of, in the very first book of Genesis, where we see that God breathes into the nostrils of the man he just created out of dust. And the man becomes a living being. He breathed life into the very soul of the human person. And he made him in God's image and likeness. Genesis 1.27 tells us. So what does that mean? When God gave us his breath, when it breathed into the nostrils of the man, what he, what he was doing is not that God has lips and, and lungs, but what he's doing is he's saying, I've placed my spirit in him. And this word breath in the Greek translations is pneuma, which is where we get the same word as spirit in, in the New Testament. So what it's saying here is God placed his spirit, his breath in man. And we were made in his image and likeness tells us that we were given an intellect and a will. And why is this important? The intellect is, is different than what I would say intelligence is. Animals have intelligence, dolphins, chimpanzees, and all, they have intelligence, and they're able to think. This intellect, what I'm talking about here, is not only the ability to have intelligence to be able to think and be smart, but also the ability to choose between right and wrong. And this is where the will also comes in. The intellect is, is that which helps us to choose right and wrong. And the will is something that's also part of that. It's this gift to us from God to be able to choose right from wrong, uh, to be able to choose anything in life. And because of that, we are very different than the animals. The animals don't ever, are never accused of being immoral, no matter what they do. If they kill another animal, if they do all sorts of what we would consider atrocities, we don't say that they're immoral. Only human beings can be immoral in this case. And this is what is the difference between our intellect and will and the fact how animals are created. So the rest of this, this animal kingdom did not res, receive this special gift. And so because we are now like God in his image and like this world, we're able to do things that the animals can't like. For example, have compassion, justice, mercy, uh, temperance, fortitude, and all these other virtues that are out there that we can have that are also part of God's character. And that's how we share in God's character. And now knowing that we are the special creation of God, that he is our father, the father of everyone. We see that in the book of Ephesians, chapter four, verse six in the New Testament, where it tells us that, that God is father of us all. And since we are his children, we see multiple confirmations of this, but the one that I really like is in, in the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 1, where it says that we are children of God, and so we are. It's not a metaphor. It's not this, this uh, concept. It is truly saying, the Word of God is saying that we are truly children of God. And because we are children, it says that we're going to inherit our Father's treasure, if you will, our Father's inheritance, because we're children of God. And I'd like to quote a little bit more fully Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17, because it's important for under, to understand who we are. Paul tells us in the book of Romans, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. He also repeats this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. When Paul talks about our relationship of, of God's children with their father, he talks about an inheritance, that we are heirs. We're, we're heirs to something. And what is this thing that we are inheriting? It's eternal life. The, the treasure that God has awaiting for us, this gift of inheritance, is 
living with him for all eternity in heaven. And so the key point to understand here about salvation is that the word inheritance is being used for that also. And so anytime that you read the scriptures in the New Testament and you see this inheritance, and even in the parables about the inheritance, you're gonna, you should quickly think back to this is speaking to us about our future, right? It is whenever in the future we will receive some kind of, of inheritance. And this inheritance and this concept of salvation needs to really be understood in familial terms. And what I mean by that is, it, I mean that the whole context of salvation is about family. It is not a courtroom. It is a family. And the reason I'll tell you the difference between the two is because there's many other theologies out there that say, well, our salvation is something that God declares on us like in a courtroom when a judge declares that you're innocent. Whether you're innocent or not, the judge declares you're innocent, it's a declaration of the courtroom, that's it, and that happens. Now, to a certain extent, that's true. We do, we are, we are declared to be righteous or, or saved, but at the same time, we are made so. There's more to it than just this, so we don't have, I don't wanna go into a lot of the theology behind uh, salvation, where we justification, righteousness, uh, imputed and infused, and all these other different things, because that, that can be a, a different class. If you have questions about that, you can uh, put them on the comments, and, and, and maybe I can answer them at another time, because this, there's volumes and volumes of books that have been written on justification, on salvation. So what I want you to understand is that the way the Catholic Church sees this, and, and the way I believe the Bible also sees this, is that salvation is a family affair. If you think about it, God revealed himself as father. He could have revealed himself as master, as the cosmic, you know, supreme being, whatever he wanted to, to reveal himself as, but he didn't. He revealed himself as father. And when he created, he created through the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Son. So if you can start to see the, the pattern here is we're talking about family terms, not courtroom terms. And so if Jesus is the son of the Father, the son of God, and if we are brought into that family through adoption, remember God only has one son. So even though we're children of God, sons and daughters of God, we are children of God through adoption. And I'll show you a, a quote here in a little bit where that says that we are brought in through adoption. Well, I just told you, Romans chapter 8, sorry about that, the very top, the spirit of adoption. And if, if Christ is our spiritual brother, then you have to think about his mother has to be our spiritual mother also. If we are brothers all together with one in Christ, then his mother is also our mother, our spiritual mother. And so this is what I'm trying to get you to understand is that the terminology regarding salvation is an inheritance, and only family members inherit, not outsiders. So think about it as we go through these slides, that this is a father that is managing his household. This is why it's the economy of salvation. He's managing his household, and how does a father father his children? He is a perfect father, and he knows what we need to be able to be saved, to be with him, for all eternity. So, I wanted to note down at the bottom there of this presentation that it says that salvation is synonymous with the words justification or righteousness in a general way for our purposes in this study. So when you look in the scriptures and you see that we are justified by faith, you can substitute the word we are saved by faith. And so there, there are some differences between just the words in the concept of salvation and justification, but in our sense here, they're gonna be synonymous because we're basically talking at a higher, more general level. So what's next? So does every child inherit no matter what? Or can a child forfeit his inheritance? Well, we know in the real world, in the human world, that not every child is gonna inherit no matter what. If that child in a family is rebellious, if the child 
decides, I don't want to be part of this family any longer, then the father can take the child out of the will of the inheritance. Um, so there's that happens in real life. And so when God uses these terminologies of inheritance, father, son, um, the gift, the free gift, because inheritance is a free gift to your children, it also has to kind of coincide with reason. So the Catholic Church teaches that salvation or justification is a process, that it's the way we live our life, that it's not a one-time event. There are Christians out there that believe that this salvation happens once and then that and then you're done. There's it's not a process, it's not anything else. Question? The the inheritance you're talking about is the inheritance of the kingdom of God up in heaven, not the physical inheritance. That's correct. Because I just I, I just read that he even set a laws about who inheritance inherit inherits the the la the promised land. Yep. Okay. Well, see, in the promised land in the Old Testament, this is a type. Remember typology where the things are signs or shadows of the future things to come, the realities? Okay. So remember, the promised land is also a type or a sign that points to the ultimate promised land, which is heaven. And the crossing of the Jordan River is basically this crossing through the waters, a dying to self, and then being going into heaven, right? And this is why um, we see the, the analogy here going between go, the people of God entering into the promised land and inheriting the land that was promised to them. And so in, in the New Testament, we see that our new inheritance, the new Jerusalem, is our new home, and that is what we're going to be inheriting. And so the, the Old Testament promised land was just a type or a sign that pointed to ultimately heaven. Okay, good question. So if if it's not a one-time event, then and it's a process, then as a result it can be lost. Because in that process, there are certain things that God requires of us. And there are some who believe that once that you are saved, that you cannot lose that salvation. That once you're justified, you're always justified. And no matter what you do, no matter what you sin, that you can't fall away from that justification. In other words, he's saying once you become a child of God through faith, you're always a child and you're going to receive the inheritance. And the church says that is the promise. That when you become a child of God, you receive that inheritance. But God... Is, is the perfect father and he doesn't raise spoiled brats. So if there's children within his family that are misbehaving, and when I say misbehaving, I'm saying sinning grip, grievously, sinning mortal sins, then you're basically saying, I don't want that inheritance. I want to do something else. And we're going to see in scripture, because it's very important uh, for me to show you in scripture that what the Catholic Church teaches is biblical why it's important for us to understand that yes you can be justified but at the same time this justification is a lifelong process and some people would say well what good is it if you can lose it by just sinning well in our previous classes we talked about mortal and venial sins and mortal sins you don't just fall by accident into a mortal sin you choose to do something gravely sinful like murder someone or to commit adultery those things don't just happen it is a process that you work work yourself into and have chosen to do it yourself so the example that i can give you here that salvation or justification can be lost are just two there's multiple throughout scripture but these are two that i think give us a very good indication in romans chapter 11 verses 20 verse 22 Paul tells us, Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And what he's talking about here is, is about this, this tree with the branches, and the Jews were these branches, I'm using an analogy here, 
and the Jews have been cut off, and the Gentiles, the non-Jews, have been grafted in now as been part of that root, and now they have part in eternal life, in this eternal salvation that the Jews were, were first given the opportunity to have. And Paul is saying they were cut off because they rejected the Messiah. Now Paul is going to the Gentiles, and he is grafting them into the root, into the, the, the main trunk for, of salvation. And he's saying, but provided you continue in your kindness, in your faith, otherwise you're going to be cut off too. And he's saying, just because the other ones were cut off doesn't mean they can't be grafted back on. In other words, the, just because the Jews, he's gone away from the Jews and now to the Gentiles to, to preach, doesn't mean that, he, that the Jews can't come back to the gospel message and believe in Christ. So the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. He's talking about circumcision here. The Jews believe that if you're not circumcised, you can't be saved. So all these Jewish converts to the Christian faith were saying you have to be circumcised first. And then you can, can become a Christian. And Paul is saying, no, you don't have to be circumcised. And he says, in, if you are, that if you do go back to your circumcision, he says, you are severed from Christ. You who could be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. And so what he's telling us here is that once you come into Christ, the rest of the stuff that was in the old law, the circumcision, all the kosher laws and all the dietary laws, all those things have gone away. They don't profit you. They were preparing you for the greater thing to come, which is Christ. And if you go back to those, then you have fallen away from grace. And if you don't have grace, you can't get into heaven. So let's, let's talk about that. God's grace. Because that's the very most important thing that out of all this out of all this subject here of salvation, that's the number one thing we have to focus on first. Yes, sir. The circumcision of today is not a religious thing anymore, is it? It's just that is correct. That is correct. So today, today the circumcision is, and even years past, it's not a religious thing. What he's talking about here, he's saying, if you believe that through the law. Because God gave the law of circumcision. He said, you have to be circumcised or else you will be expelled from my people. You can't be part of my people. And you would have to be circumcised on the eighth day. This is what we're talking about. That you're trying to go back to following the old law. That that circumcision brings you into the family of God. And that was the Old Testament way of coming into the family of God was through circumcision. And now he's saying, if you go back to that, then what Christ has done for you is no good. Because you're following the old law, there's a new law here. And if you don't, if you come into the new law and you want to go back to the old, then Christ is not for you, and you have fallen from grace. Is what he's saying. So now, um, so now that we know who we are, we can finally ask the question again: that as a child of God, what must I do to inherit life? Just because I'm a child now, does that mean? I'm done. I don't have to. In, in my family, if my kids go, hey, I'm in Avila, so I'm just going to inherit. I don't have to do any chores. I don't have to obey my parents. I don't have to, you know, come in at, at, at the time they tell me to. Uh, they need to give me a car. I'm going to eat and sleep and do whatever I want to. I don't even have to go to school if I want to. What kind of a kid would that be, right? It's the one that you're going to kick out of the house if they don't straighten up. And that's what the dis disinheritance is part. God does not raise children like that. He wants us to be produ spiritually productive children. I'm going to show you that too because he wants us to bear fruit as his children. Just like I want my children to bear fruit. I don't want them to be lazy at home doing nothing and just playing video games till they're 40 and then wondering, hey, what happened? Right? So, so that's I'm not trying to be critical of anybody but the, my point is that our children um, we have expectations for them, and God has expectations for us as His children. By bearing fruit, you're not talking about just having children. Then you're talking about being productive in society and all that. Yeah, and, and when, I, when I'm talking about bearing fruit, meaning what gifts has God given you that you are supposed to take 
and use to further the kingdom of God here on earth. So if you've been given the gift of preaching, but but you decide, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm afraid to go in front of people. But God's giving you that gift, then you're not bearing fruit with what he's given you. And so music is another example. Uh, all sorts of different things that God has for us as his children that he wants us to do in this world. Because we are the ones that are going to help to evangelize those who don't know Christ or maybe have fallen away from Christ. You and I are the ones that have been given gifts to be able to bring those people back to him. So the rest of the study, we're going to look at the scriptures to see how this economy of salvation unfolds. Number one, in the scriptures and in the church teaches that salvation is by God's grace alone. This is the most important footnote note here that I want you to, to take away from this. That God takes the first initiative. His grace is a free gift. And what is grace? Grace is nothing less than God's very self, his very being, his very life. And I had ex explained to that in a previous class, that if you use the analogy of a body, um, that the grace is like the blood flowing through the body. That's what keeps it alive. And so God's grace is like the blood, if you will, of the soul that keeps it alive. And it's this grace that God gives us freely because we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. He gives it to us free. And the point is, for all this, is that we can't even have faith without God first giving us grace to be able to have faith. So even our faith in God depends on the grace that he gives us to be able to have faith. Now, the question could be, well, does God give everybody the same amount of grace to believe? The answer is no. God does not give everybody the same amount of grace. But one thing he does give is he gives everyone sufficient grace to be able to be saved. He gives some more, some less, but everyone gets enough grace to be able to be saved. Otherwise, he would be an unjust God. Because if, if our salvation depends on his grace and he doesn't give us enough, there's no way we can make it. The, the, uh, last week you mentioned about that. You used an analogy about a glass or a cup of water uh, and that, that each one is filled accordingly. Now, when you say sufficient grace, it's sufficient enough to fill that cup or that glass uh, that they have? Or more that it's actually overflowing? No, so, and that's a very good question. Uh, we don't want to confuse that analogy because I was using that analogy to the different levels in heaven, right? Because not everybody gets the same reward in heaven. Some get more, some get less, but everybody gets filled. So that was kind of my point. Everybody's full to capacity, if you will, of the, the uh, reward they're going to be given. And so, thank you. So on, in this case, what I'm saying is whatever it takes for us to get into heaven, it could be that you're just barely sliding underneath the door before it closes, you know, or, or whatever. It's, it's going to be enough grace so that whatever you do in life, you're going to be able to get to heaven. Now, for some, he gives more. He'll give them um, so much grace that, and I've seen examples of this, a child who parents don't go to mass, who are not believers, and the child as a seven, eight-year-old goes to mass because they live like right across the street, goes to the church, goes to mass, and falls in love with the mass, serves, and wants to be a priest. And you're like, how does that happen? None of that happened in the household. It all had to be God's grace working in this child that the Lord gave him that additional grace to be able to love the Mass, love Christ, and want to become a priest. So it's those type of things that I'm talking about there, That, but everyone gets enough to get into heaven. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, it tells us that by grace we have been saved. Now, this grace is going to be manifested in multiple ways, and this is what we're going to do after this first, this number one here, number two through whatever, 11, it's going to be, how does that grace manifest itself in the scripture and in our life? And this grace 
is necessary for us to, to be able to even believe. So in Acts chapter 18, verse 27, we also see um, when he arrived, when Paul arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. See, belief comes because God gave us the grace to. In Romans chapter 5, verse 15, for as if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. Again, it's a free gift. We can't earn it. In fact, what we deserve is condemnation. We don't deserve salvation. Even one sin is an infinite offense against an infinitely holy God. So we could never, ever merit heaven just on our own. It's God's mercy and his love for us that first says, I'm going to give you grace so that you can turn your heart, believe in me, and live out your faith as I've called you to. So what are some of these items that we're going to unpack here, some of these manifestations of grace? Well, first, I would say is repentance. We need to repent of our former way of life and live for Christ. Repent in the Greek word is metanoia. Metanoia is a radical change of the mind. And this is what repentance is about, is that we are living a certain life, and when we encounter Christ, He transforms our life and our mind, and we completely turn over a new leaf. We are a new creation. And it's this repentance that Luke chapter 13 tells us, where Christ is talking to his disciples. He says, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. So the first step is we need to acknowledge that we need to change, that we need God's grace, that we need that grace so that we can be saved. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, we see Jesus comes into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the first step we must do is repent. Number three, salvation is through faith. By the grace of God, we are saved through faith. This faith entails by its very nature good works that are always enabled by a prior grace without which this faith is dead. In other words, faith by itself without any works is dead. We're going to see that in James chapter 2. So faith is very important, but faith is a working faith. It's a living faith. It's not just a, a concept in your mind that I believe Jesus is Lord and God. It's more than that. Faith is lived out, not just in your head. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 tells us, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So part of this grace that God has given us is first of all to acknowledge that we're sinners, to turn our life around, and secondly, to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who revealed himself to us as the Son of God and as a sacrifice or as an offering to, to the God the Father for our sins, so that our sins could be forgiven. And so we must believe in Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other name by which we can be saved except through Jesus Christ. If we want a way to the Father, can only be through the Son. And that is the faith that we must have. He is everything. And so that's, that's the second piece of this. What else do we need? Well, do we need to keep the commandments? Do we need to do good deeds? Well, apparently, in the book of Matthew, someone asked Jesus that question. Matthew 19, verses 16 through 17. Then someone came to him, to Jesus, and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So what's the context here? I want to get to heaven. What do I need to do? And he said, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he 
he lists the commandments. And he listed, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not covet. And so it's these things that, that Christ is saying, you need to live out your life in holiness, which we're going to get to here in just a minute. You need to be able to follow the commandments if you want to have life. So we can't just say, well, I believe Jesus is Lord and Savior, and I'm done. I don't have to follow the commandments. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Number five, we have to perform good deeds or good works to be saved. We see a very good example of this in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 36. It's a little bit lengthier, so I encourage you to go into the book of Matthew chapter 25 and read that whole last section. Because this is when Jesus tells his apostles that the end of time is going to be like when a shepherd gathers the sheep and the goats. And this is the, the story that he's telling. And he's going to separate them, the goats on the left, the sheep on the right, and the sheep on the right are the ones that are going to go to heaven. And he says, he says, this is going to happen. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. Again, who inherits? The children, right? And, and he says, blessed of my father. So again, this is family talking here. This is family talk. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. And I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And the list goes on. I was in prison, and you visited me, etc., etc. I was naked, you clothed me. And so it's important for us to understand that Jesus is telling us that at the end of time, he's going to, this is the final judgment that we talked about at the, at the last class, right? The separation of the good and the evil, the good and the bad, the sheep and the goats. And this is what's going to happen. He's going to say, how much did you love while you were on earth? How much did you love? Did you feed those who were hungry? Because when you did it to them, what does he say in this? That's why I encourage you to read the whole thing. He said, when you did it to the least of this, you did it to me. You did it to me. So there's a requirement here that this father wants of his children, that if they're going to inherit, they have to take care of one another. Because they're all children of God in one way or another. It's, you've got to take care of one another. If your brother's hungry, feed him. If he's naked, clothe him. Or else you're not going to get into heaven. This is what he's saying in, in, right here in the scripture. Important for us to know, and this is why when you read the, uh, the corporal works of mercy, it goes through that list. These are some of the, the corporal works of mercy come from that list right there. And we covered them last time for time before, actually. Uh, again, we look at James chapter 2, verse 21 through 26. I, I encourage you to read all of James chapter 2. You get a chance, because this is very important. We get through to 21, and it says, James says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Do you see that faith cooperated with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect? See, here James is not pitting faith against works. He's saying, if you're a true believer, then your work's going to show it. Because you can have two people, as an example. One's a believer and one's an atheist. And if you didn't know who was what, you can go watch them both. And if they both feed the hungry, clothe the naked, because there's a lot of people out there who are not believers, who are great philanthropists. They give money and provide food and shelter stuff for people, but they don't believe. If you looked at those two people doing the exact same acts of charity, you couldn't tell them apart. The difference between the two is one of them's gonna get to heaven and one of them's not. And how do you know? Because one of them believes and the other one does not. And so it's, just not, it's not just good deeds, it's good deeds done through Christ, in Christ, and with Christ. And it is, it is when you're a child of God that you are doing these things that the Father looks at you and says, that's my good and faithful servant there. And I'm very proud of you. So it's important for us to understand that. That what, what James is talking about here is that faith is perfected through works. And what works is he talking about? He, he mentions previously in that 
that he says if someone comes to your door and knocks and they they're, they're, it's cold and they ask for some warm clothing and he says hello be well and, and go on your way and you don't help them can your faith save you he says it's, been, it's a rhetorical question he's saying no your faith will not save you if your brother comes to you and is in need and you turn him away your faith cannot save you and so it's faith and works as the church teaches is like a coin, a two-sided coin. They go with each other, the heads and the tails. You can't separate the two from the other. And so it's very important for, for you to go through James chapter 2 and read all of it very carefully because at the very end it says, so you see that a man is justified, key word, justified, saved, by works and not by faith alone. Okay. Note here, he did not say by works alone. We don't believe that either. You don't work your way to heaven. Right? It is justified by works and not by faith alone. Because what's happening here in James is people were saying, I believe. I'm a child of God. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I've got it made. And he's saying, no. You better live out your faith. If you don't live out your faith, you're not going to make it. So you have to work. And that work is work done in faith, in Christ, and with Christ, and through Christ. In Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, we see Paul telling us, for he, God, will render to every man according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. He will give eternal life to those. And how is he going to judge us? According to what we've done. And what, what we're talking about here is those works of feeding the hungry. In, in other words, loving your neighbor, loving your brothers, doing what you would do if Christ was present. Even to the point of maybe even giving up your life for someone. And that's the ultimate price. That's the ultimate gift. And so what I want you want to point out from here is that I don't want to emphasize so much on just works because a lot of people think that if I am a good person that I'm just I'm going to go to heaven it's more than that as we got to kind of go through here uh, in this list we're going to expand even more that it's not good enough to just be a good person what does that mean even, to be a good person right I don't steal I don't kill but do you help people do you feed the hungry do you clothe the naked are you good to your spouse do you educate your children in the faith? Those are the things that we have that God's going to ask us. And those are the things that at the end of time, where it says here in Romans, that he's going to render to every one of us according to our works, to what we have done or not done. And he will give eternal life to those who seek for glory and honor and immortality. Number six is holiness. Holiness is also this word sanctification. If you hear sanctify or sanctification, it means to make holy or to make pure, to sanctify. And so a lot of times we, we're like, well, holiness is for like the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? She was holy. No one can reach to her level, so I shouldn't even try. Well, that's absolutely the wrong thing. In fact, that's contrary to what Christ asks of us. Excuse me. Holiness is necessary for salvation. We see that in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 14. We, we are told, strive for peace with all men and strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you don't have a particular level of holiness, you're not going to see the Lord. It's important. Holiness. What is that? What is it? Uh Go ahead. Even if we get into heaven, if we're not at the holiness, we won't see the Lord. He's talking about you're not even making it to heaven. Oof. Because holiness, <laughs> holiness is a way of life. Okay? Holiness is a way of life. And we're going to go through some of these. Holiness is not just you're sinless. That's not what holiness means. No one's sinless. No one would make it if that were the definition. Holiness is living out who you were made how you were made. 
Remember I told you you were a child of God? You need to live out your life as a child of God. And what does a child of God look like? I'm telling you. You have to have faith. You have to have repentance. And in the previous, you have to follow the commandments. You have to do good, good deeds. You have to love your neighbor, right? You have to love the people who are naked and, and thirsty and in prison. This is what a child of God looks like, is what I'm showing you. And so holiness, this purity of life, also can apply to, in like in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And, and, and I'm telling you this because this is not easy stuff. It's very easy to say, I believe and I'm done. But that's not what the scriptures tell us. Being a Christian is hard. Being a Christian is hard. Because it is following Christ. And that is the perfect measure. Impossible to fulfill, but that is always our goal throughout our entire life. That's what he told us. If you wish to be my disciple, you pick up your cross and you follow me. And where does that cross lead? To the sacrifice on Calvary. He's asking us to sacrifice our very desires, our very self-love for the love of others. Just like he did on the cross. For love of others. That's what he wants. That's how you're saved. And so these are all things that lead to that. And this holiness in Galatians 5, chapter 19, verse 21, these are the things that are going to keep you from making it to Calvary to offer yourself. Paul says, the works of the flesh, remember again, the flesh, these human passions are plain. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness. What does that mean? That means uh, sleeping around. Idolatry, putting other things before God, like maybe the football game instead of going to, to Mass, something like that. Uh, sorcery, playing on the Ouija board, seances, those type of things. Invoking uh, demons or any type of brujeria or anything um, like that, those are the things that sorcery includes. Enmity, strife, jealousy, <laughs> anger, selfishness. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Did I get you on the first one? No, with the brujeria. I mean, because in the, the, the Latin community, Latino community, the, the, the whole, you know, hitting somebody with a branch and rubbing with the egg and all that, isn't that brujeria? It's superstition. It's superstition. Now, here's, oh. here, here's, the, here's the thing that we need to back up a little bit. Remember, in our other class, we talked about that you have to know that it's a sin, right? For it to be counted as a mortal sin against you. In other words, to condemn you to hell. God's not going to condemn anyone that doesn't know that they're doing something wrong. You see, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> well, well, how do we know that our parents, because I know my mom has done this, okay? Because, I mean, because I've seen her do it, or she's asked somebody to come over to do it. And I think my mom is like the Virgin Mary, man. And so now I'm hearing this, and I'm like, oh, mom is not going in. <laughs> no, no, no. Remember ignorance, okay? But here's the thing. We don't leave our, our loved ones in ignorance. We say, well, what, what's the answer? Let's say that I did it, and I did it for 10 years, and then I found out today that that was wrong. What do I do? Repent. Sort of repent of it. There you go. Step number two. So then, so then now and because, then you do? because I, now I've never done brujeria on my kids or on myself or nothing. But I didn't know. So, so I'm okay, right? But now I know. Now that I told my mom, you got to repent of this? Yes. yes. And you need to Ooh. tell her, look, how easy is it? We all should be going to confession once a month, once every three, four, six months. Once a year, the, the church demands or says we have to go to confession once a year. In that confession, what do you have to do? Father, you know what? I didn't know this, but I found out that this superstitious stuff was wrong. I'm asking for forgiveness. And it's wiped clean, dude. It's gone. It's that simple. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> and so so we, we, we can't treat it like, oh, God, you know, I, I'm done. I'm going to hell. No. Well, I'm looking at all these things right here. Look I'm at like, I'm done. Man. <laughs> Look at them. <laughs> Look, man. I know. I'm going to go through them one and more you're time. <laughs> Enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, a party spirit, and envy, and drunkenness, and carousing, and the like. 
And I warn you that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so so what happens, and, and this is a good, you touch a good point, because we see even whether ourselves or relatives or people we know that maybe some of these things are, are happening in their life, right? Here's the thing. If I'm getting drunk, what example am I setting for my children? And what am I doing when I'm drunk? And a lot of people lose control. And that's what happens in a lot of uh, affairs, in, in uh, fighting, in murder, stuff. People don't have self-control because they're under the influence of something. But drunkenness is drunkenness, isn't it? It's like murder is murder. Murder is murder, drunkenness is drunkenness. Oh, I don't know what your point well, is. Well, I've still got to repent, right? Yeah. You whether know. whether oh, I'm drunk and I'm a happy drunk and I don't do nothing bad. Look, and that's fine too. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is no like a 0.08% alcohol <laughs> that you got to go to confession, okay? That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is, is when the alcohol has control of you, instead of you have control of the alcohol. This is what this is talking about. Also, oh, more into like the alcoholism. The alcoholism, and being an addict, being drunken. I'm not talking about having a good time on the weekend, Labor Day weekend, and drinking a few beers and getting a little tipsy. You know, oh, that's not what I'm talking about. In fact, in fact, I think there, there's a sense of, of enjoying the good things God's given you. We need we need to be able to do that. But when you take it past the point where now you're slobbering drunk and you're saying things you you don't even remember you said and touching people you didn't, weren't supposed to be touching and all these other things, then it's kind of control of you. And this is what we're talking about here is that when you lose control, and, and, and not just talking about anger either, because there's a certain thing called righteous anger. Jesus showed us that at the, at the temple when he took a rope and he whipped all these money changers in the temple, right? He was angry. And that's okay when you're angry for, and you're zealous for God in the right way. But when you're just an angry person, because life dealt you a bad hand or whatever, and you have anger and hatred in your heart all the time, that's what this is talking about. Right? And, and, and if you don't know that you need that help, or you don't have a way, no one's told you, look, Jesus Christ is the answer to your anger. Jesus Christ is the answer to your alcoholism. He's the answer to your pornography addiction. He's the answer to your whatever it is that you can fill in, he's the answer. And if no one's told him that, then he's searching. He or she is out there searching. And it's up to us to do what? To say, hey, brother, this is not the way to go, man. The way you're, your life, you're leading your life right now, it's leading you to nowhere. And I love you too much to let you stay there. So I'm going to tell you, get some help. Get some help with your addiction, whatever it may be, or you're abusive to a spouse, whatever it may be, you need to change, brother. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And when we don't, if God puts that into our path and we don't do those things, because of the Spirit, in the Spirit, you're growing and living a sacramental life, this stuff does not seem impossible. In fact, you recognize it and you go to it and you say, Brother, let me help you. Hey, I saw that your house got flooded. Let me help you. Why are you doing this? Because we're supposed to take care of each other. What does that have to do? Well, because I'm Catholic. I believe in, in Christ. He goes, well, I don't go to church. Your opportunity to witness the love of Christ and helping others. And it happens. I've witnessed it myself. So, kind of bit going back to this, it's tough. <laughs> Holiness is not an option. But here's what, here's, and I mentioned this in the other one, the, the biggest lie that the devil has perpetrated is that you and I cannot be holy that we can't avoid these things. The devil tells us, man, dude, you're not the Virgin Mary. You can't do that. You know, just so just kind of give in. It's okay. God understands because you're not very strong. Mm -hmm. God says, I'm going to give you my grace, my very life I'm going to give you. And if my grace is not sufficient to turn you away from that, then that is your problem. Because I can assure you his grace is all powerful. It's more powerful than any sin that you could ever name on here. And he can change that. So it's important for us not to believe the lie that we can't avoid these things. It's a lie. We can. How many men and women live where they're not practicing enmity and, and selfishness and, and gossiping and all these other drunkenness and everything? Lots of people do that. 
That those are our models, and we should be models for others. Number seven, we are to love God and our neighbor to be saved. Luke chapter 10 tells us that a lawyer asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here's another question. Well, when we say keep the commandments, right, the first three commandments are all dealing with whom? God. With God, loving God. And so what is Jesus' answer? He says, what's written in the law? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered right. Do this and you will live. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And you will get to heaven. So the message is very simple. How do I get to heaven? Love God, love neighbor. But what does that look like? Is, is over here being angry at someone loving my neighbor? Or being jealous? No. It's not loving my neighbor. Is being uh, licentious, lusting after uh, someone, loving my neighbor? No, it's not. So when you say love neighbor, it means a lot. There's a lot that encompasses that. Even though the words are simple, it, it's not easy to do without God's grace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, we see that if you should have prophecy, and should know all mysteries and knowledge, and if you should have all faith, so as to move a mountain. Now that's a, a lot of faith. I don't know anybody that's ever moved a mountain. If you have that kind of faith, and you have not love, you are nothing. You're nothing. So there are people, we see in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, people said, the Lord said, hey, people were going to come knocking and saying, Lord, let us in, let us in. And he says, go away, I do not know you. He says, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons. We did all these miracles in your name. And the Lord's going to tell them, I know you not. Depart from me. Serious words here. So just because we are performing miracles doesn't automatically get us into heaven either. Because guess what? The devil can perform miracles. The devil gives people who follow him the ability to perform miracles. So a lot of this brujeria... It doesn't come from the Lord. It comes from the demonic side. And they have power. They have physical power to be able to heal, to be able to do miracles, to do things that are supernatural, beyond our, our imagination. They're capable of doing that. And so we can't just say, oh, I saw a miracle. That must be from God. We have to be careful. Number eight, we have to persevere. And also we must... We live sacramental lives. Number eight, we must partake of the sacraments of baptism, Eucharist, and confession to be saved. John chapter 6, I've told you this one already before, but read all of John chapter 6, but especially starting in verse 48. And Jesus says to the people, that his disciples, he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Very important. This is talking about the Eucharist. One year later, we see in uh, Matthew chapter 26 that the Lord says at the Passover, when he takes the bread, he says, this is my body. Eat. Okay? This is the cup of my blood of the new covenant. Drink of this. And this is for eternal life. This is the sacrament of the Eucharist. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, we see that Jesus tells his disciples, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. He doesn't say whoever believes and they want to be baptized is going to be saved. Faith and baptism go together. Okay? And this is specifically for, for adults. We don't have time to talk about infant baptism, but maybe at a later time. In fact, I think we're going to talk about Tuesday. baptism Tuesday, yes, the 26th mm -hmm. at 7, 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. We're going to have another Facebook Live Tuesday, uh, the 26th. Six. Facebook Live, Sacred Heart, Conroe, Facebook. All right, on baptism. First uh, Peter chapter three verse twenty. Baptism now saves you. And then we see in First John chapter one verse nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If our sins are not forgiven, we will not enter heaven. We have to have our sins forgiven. And right here, John is telling us that we have to confess our sins. 
Now, we don't have time to go into the sacrament of confession and how this applies, but um, nevertheless, confessing of our sins, acknowledging that we're sinners, is, and, and asking for forgiveness is part of our salvation. Number nine, we have to persevere to the end to be saved. Mark, Matt, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, we see the Lord um, telling his apostles, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. What's he implying here? That the one who doesn't endure to the end will not be saved. We have to persevere. And how do we persevere in this struggle? Through, through what? Through God's grace. Through his grace alone is the only way we're going to make it. Matthew chapter 24 verse 13. Because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. This is in the last times. He's talking about, read all of chapter 24 too, because he talks about the end times. That the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. In all this tribulation, and all this suffering, you have to endure to the end to be saved. You cannot lose your faith. Number 10, we have to bear fruit to be saved. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that does not bear fruit. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them, bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember that. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. We cannot do anything apart from him. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. And such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. What's he talking about here? He's using an analogy to talk about health. If you don't, if you're cut off because you're not bearing fruit, you're going to be like that branch that's cut off. And if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be thrown into the fire and burned. You have no chance. So it's up to us to figure out how do I bear fruit? There's, I've been giving you all these examples of how to bear fruit. Number 11, and this is the last one, it's kind of an interesting note on bearing fruit and bearing children. So, it says here in 1 Timothy 2.15, yet woman will be saved through bearing children if she continues in faith and love and holiness with modesty. So the more children you have, I don't know what that means, maybe a higher place in heaven, I don't know. But what it's telling us here is that the woman's going to be saved through giving birth to children. How is that? Because if you think about it, I told you that the great, one of the greatest examples of, give, of love, authentic love, which means to, to meet the needs of the other before yours, put the needs of others before yours, is a mother with her children. And who gives up more than, than that? No one. The mother gives up her whole body for nine months, and then when she gives birth, she gives everything of herself, and then after that, she gives herself even, a, continue to give herself by nurturing the baby, by nursing the baby, by taking care of the baby, and it just goes on. It is this, this is what authentic love looks like. One who is willing to give up even their very own body, their very own self, for the sake of someone else. And this is why I think that, that Paul tells us here that the, a woman can be saved through childbearing because it involves faith, love, and holiness. To be able to, to be a Christian woman and, and give birth to nine children, 11 children, whatever children God gives you. But this doesn't mean that they can break the commandments either, right? No, because it talks about holiness, right? And love. Is love contrary? Is love equal to, in any way to breaking commandments? No. Love of God means you keep the commandments. Love of neighbor means you keep the commandments. So every one of these, love, faith, and holiness, all have built into them that we're going to live out a life that is in accordance with commandments, loving God, loving neighbor, and staying away from all those nasty, what is it, Ephesians 5, Galatians 5, works of the flesh, staying away from all those. That's the life that it's talking about here. And the modesty is also part of that. So, in summary, salvation is the journey of a child to his heavenly father. On this earth, we're traveling in this life. And as a child of God, God knows you're going to stumble. God knows you're going 
that you're going to make a mistake, and you may not even know you made a mistake. But he wants us to continually search for him, that living in his grace, he's going to reveal to us something doesn't feel right about what I'm doing. I don't know what it is. Maybe I need to go ask someone who knows. Maybe I need to go ask a friend. Maybe I need to go ask Father Philip. I think I'm, I'm doing this. It doesn't feel right. Can you help me? This is what a confessor, which I will mention in the Christian spirituality, oh, uh, in the way of perfection also, to have a confessor, someone you can tell about your life and they can guide you. Salvation is an intimate communion with God in this world and in the next. See, God doesn't just want that, that communion just in heaven. He wants us to start now. We're his children and he loves us and he wants us to get to heaven. And salvation is a loving relationship with God and our fellow man. It is all about relationship. It's not about check boxes, following rules. It's not about receiving all the sacraments and the check box and all these other things. It is about a family relationship. And if we can understand salvation in that manner, if we can take it to our families, then I think our families will grow in love and charity and love for God and love for one another. And none of this can be done apart from Jesus Christ. And apart from all the stuff we've just covered about salvation, everything else is secondary. If we don't get this right, then we've been putting the the, the first things last and the last things first. We've been going in the wrong order. This should take priority in our life. How will I inherit eternal life? Wow. Thank you. Are, are we, are we going to have class next week? Good question. So next week we're going to do a Tuesday session on baptism, uh, for the specifically for the baptism parents and whatnot. So we're going to skip next Wednesday, uh, the 27th, I guess that would be, and uh, and we'll announce see if there's going to be one the following Wednesday after that. Um, there is a question that I have that um, <coughs> if somebody is not here in Conroe, then Daniela, you might be able to answer this one too. If they're not here in Conroe, but they take this class that you're doing on, on baptism, can that count towards their class wherever they're at? Then we have to ask their their parish. Their parish, yeah. Right? Okay. Their and pastor. it potentially could. A lot of parishes are very open to look. If you'll take the class someplace else, send me a letter that you took it. A lot of times they'll accept that, okay. but it's going to be up to the to the to the pastor. To the pastor.